Our fossil lab just puzzled together a giant clam that lived 50 million years ago. It's four and a half feet tall, lovingly named Chowder, and when we posted about it online, you all, understandably, had questions. So, it's time to call on the experts, warm up a can of Chowder, and get to the bottom of what you all want to know about giant clams. Uh, I'm Kelsey Abrams, and I'm the Fossil Lab Manager at the Brook Museum. I'm Anthony Maltese. I'm the curator at the Rocky Mountain Dinosaur Resource Center in Woodland Park, Colorado. I'm Melissa Fry. I'm the Collections Manager of Invertebrate Zoology, and I work on the Malacology Collection. There have been fossil pearls found before. I've never personally found any, but Anthony's done a lot of work in the chalk before, and I bet he has some fossil pearls to talk about. Yeah, believe it or not, we find them out in Western Kansas. I've been working in the chalk in Kansas for about 25 years now, and this one right here is the only one that I've found so far. <laughs> Unfortunately, you don't have the mother of pearl sort of look to the shells anymore after spending 87 million years under Kansas. What I call a giant clam, which is the tridactnid, the tridactnid gigas, which is the modern giant clam. They also can make pearls. I think the largest one that has ever been found has come from a giant clam, a modern giant clam. And it looked like, um, unfortunately, it looked like a small brain. Mm. Wait, that's so, so cool. Yeah. I'm booting that to Anthony. I think that since Kelsey did such a good job heading up the preparation of it, that uh, if you if you were to go look at the shell, you could probably actually see annual uh, bands on there and determine that. If you're a paleo student at the University of Washington and you want to come do that study on how old chowder is, hit us up. Giant clams, the tridactnid giant clams, can live for up to 100 years. I don't know about uh, chowder, but many mollusks grow quickly in the early stages of their lives, something like in their first year, like four to six inches. So they can grow, they grow really fast, and that makes sense because they wanna grow and not get eaten, and then after that, they start to grow more regularly. <laughs> Just make something up, Anthony, nobody's yeah. gonna... Who's going to argue with you? Well, there's a, there's a little <laughs> bit of a debate on uh, on these animals and how they lived on the seafloor. Some people have suggested that they, they were kind of flat and floating on the seafloor muds. We find barnacles and uh, oysters on both valves of the uh, giant clams. And so it was unlikely that they lived like that. So they were probably more, more vertical. In that case, I mean, there's not a whole lot of pressure from gravity or anything trying to pull your, uh, your valves apart or anything like that. So I don't think that they they were very strong in clamping at all. There's sort of a myth that goes along with these giant clams. Historically, they've been sold as these animals that like divers can get caught in and you have to be really careful. They used to be considered kind of like man eaters. The reality is, is that giant clams can't even really close their shells completely. So you're not gonna get caught in it. And the reason they can't close is fascinating. It's because of microorganisms called zooxanthellae that live in its mouth and feed it nutrients. A mutualistic relationship they live within the tissues of the clam. That's why when you look at a live giant clam, the, the mantle and all the tissues are like bright green and blue and yellow, and they're very iridescent. The zooxanthellae photosynthesize just like they do in corals, and then they provide nutrients to the clams. So they get a lot of their nutrients, not 100%, but a lot of their nutrients from the zooxanthellae. So all those sugars that the zooxanthellae is fixing, they give to the clam. When you're hosting photosynthetic dinoflagellates, you need to have, they need to have access to the sun. So they keep their valves open. They're kind of like gaping so that the, during the day, the zooxanthellae is able to photosynthesize. Our chowder came from Kansas, and 87 million years ago, Kansas was underwater in a body of water called the Western Interior Seaway. Um, the Western Interior Seaway ran from the Gulf of Mexico up through Canada um, in the late Cretaceous. There was a lot uh, more heat back then and there was less water that was locked up in ice caps. So the interior of the country was flooded with water. And in the bottom of that ocean was sitting our chowder. These live in warm water, shallow warm waters. Remember they have those anthalae living within their tissues so they need to be in sunlight. They're coral reef adjacent, meaning they live in the sands or the coral rubble adjacent to coral reefs. So there are a lot of um, coral reef animals um, rely on things like this shell creates a lot of habitat for other animals as well. So it's a, a good ecosystem player. 
lots of things go for bivalves and clams. Um, I'm working on a fish right now that actually used these clams, not necessarily to, to eat them, but it smashed its face into the sides of the clams, breaking up the oysters that encrusted the outside of them and then kind of slurped up the uh, residues. I'm working on describing a new animal, which will be coming out soon. You're going to have to wait for the paper that also looks like it was eating hard shell things at about the same time. And uh, we have these big sharks called Tychidus that have these teeth that are sort of shaped like gumdrops, a whole battery of them in their mouths. And they were used for crushing hard shelled things as well. How much meat are we talking? That's a big, big clam fry. I really don't know how much uh, of that shell would be filled. These things are living much, much differently than, than modern giant clams. Um, and probably chemosynthetic as well. I mean, when you're talking about a very anoxic bottom water, there's probably a lot of hydrogen sulfide in those uh, waters as well. So, you know, they, it would probably taste a lot like sulfur and just r really kind of gross if you were going for that meat anyway, especially the larger ones. If you wanted to eat it, you could probably get a fairly good meal of several pounds of um, meat out of the inside, but uh, it probably wouldn't be the tastiest thing. I like uh, I like puzzling them together, not eating them. Giant clams are not harvested for their pearls. They're harvested for their meat or their shells. And um, unfortunately, these animals are in decline in many places in the world. They recently were listed as critically endangered by the IUCN. That said, um, people really value them. They're considered a delicacy. The, the meat is considered a delicacy. And the meat, by when I say meat, it's actually the muscles that hold the valves together. And so they have started farming them through aquaculture in different places, like even places like Hawaii, Micronesia. Um, but yeah, we're not gonna be able to find them anywhere, like any in any of our fish and chips stores, like eating chowder. We're not, we're not gonna find giant clam chowder anywhere around here. What do you think? Salty. Salty. Yeah, Salty, rubbery. <laughs> mm. I got a potato. <laughs>